Awesome. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. And um, my, my section of the presentation, as Kelly mentioned, is going to be talking about food in your brain. And we literally are what we eat. And um, I have a few objectives or, or hopes for the evening, things that I would like to teach you um, or tell you about. And it may be a review of things that you already know. The first few slides are going to be an overview of how nutrition can literally impact our thinking, our cognition, our memory, our mood, all kinds of different things, and how certain foods can help all of those things or hinder all of those things. But really my objective is to give you some really good practical tools, i.e. which food should you be eating to achieve um, brain healing, brain health, and modifications in some of those areas of um, thinking, cognition, memory, um, that you may be looking for some help through natural ways. So um, going to, as I mentioned, going to be doing an overview of nutrition and brain health. We're going to talk about two specific types of diets, the Mediterranean diet and the MIND diet, um, what they incorporate, how they are similar to each other, and you'll see as we talk about specific foods as we go along through the presentation that there is a lot of overlap among the recommendations in both the Mediterranean and the MIND diets for, for brain health. We're going to be talking about dietary fats for brain health, the carbohydrate connection. We hear a lot about carbs and sugar in the media and um, all over the place now with lots more research coming out. Um, we want to learn the information that's based on research and not myth. Um, we're going to talk about vitamin, mineral, and other supplementation for brain health. The gut microbiome, this is a new section in my presentation for this year. Um, our gut, our digestive system, really does mediate so many aspects of our health, including our cognition. And I'm just going to touch on that, um, but happy to answer whatever questions I can at the end. Your grocery list for brain health. So in your package, in the slides for those who are tuning in from home or from other sites, um, I literally have a grocery list for brain health that you can actually use to put your grocery list together when you're going to the grocery store and uh, hopefully when you're going to be improving your diets if you're not already doing the things that we're recommending tonight. And then I do have an appendix on healthy eating on a budget because that can be a, a consideration for so many people. So food and nutrition for brain health and function. Specific nutrients found in whole foods, and you're going to hear me talk about whole foods a lot throughout the presentation. A whole food is basically what it sounds like. It's the way the food came out of the ground, out of the tree, off the farm, before it's processed, before it's dismantled, and things are pulled out of it, and then things are artificially added back into it. So the more foods that we can eat in their natural form, the better from a brain health and, and optimum health perspective. So specific nutrients found in whole foods are essential for memory functions and learning, linked to faster thought processing. They're required to lower blood levels of inflammatory chemicals in the brain and body. And we're going to be talking a lot about inflammation, anti-inflammatory foods, foods that are what we call pro-inflammatory or what actually cause inflammation in the body and the brain. Um, so you'll, you'll see in inflammatory stuff throughout the presentation. Um, these nutrients are necessary to provide protection against damaging oxidation to brain and body. So in our grocery list for brain health, the foods in each list are anti-inflammatory anti and, and or antioxidative. And a lot of the foods that we're going to be talking about do both. And um, these nutrients are essential to prevent age-related dementias, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other brain disorders. And the MIND diet that we're going to be talking about really does focus on dementias and Alzheimer's and some really, really exciting research that's come out of that that I want to share. So food and nutrition for brain health and function, again, foods can increase or dis decrease risk for depression and negative mental health status or states, depending on your food choices. These foods and nutrients can increase or decrease the intensity of the depression, depending on what foods that we choose. 
and the foods that we choose and the nutrients contained in the foods can increase or decrease irritability, aggressive behaviors, feelings of anger, depending on our choices and the nutrients and the foods that we choose. And this is all based on research. You know, we, we've probably heard a lot about it. Um, if you've had brain injuries yourselves or you're here on behalf of a family member, you've probably heard snippets of this information. You've maybe seen or experienced yourself how this can really play out um, positively or negatively depending on how you're eating. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies in the brain can alter cognition, can create confusion or make confusion worse, um, can create or make worse disor the feelings of disorientation, can result in memory deficit, anxiety, paranoia, restlessness, insomnia, headaches, depression and mood disorders, vision impairment and other consequences. So certain foods that we eat can create these things and not eating the right foods and re resulting in certain vitamin, mineral and other deficiencies can create these situations. So I call these brain boosting, well we can have the, the brain boosting eating patterns or we have the brain buster eating patterns and we're going to talk about the western type diet um, sort of the fast food, processed food type diet compared to these diets such as the Mediterranean diet and the MIND diet. And why are they different and, and how do they work in our brain and bodies? So the key components of the Mediterranean diet include vegetables and fruits, whole grains, olive oil, legumes, nuts, seeds, low fat dairy, herbs and spices every single day. And I'm the dietitian for the inpatient brain injury program here at Parkwood for probably, I think, the last 20 years. And I say to the patients that I work with, vegetables are magic. I run into so many people who say, you know, I'll do a diet history. You know, what do you typically eat at, you know, meals and snacks? And, um, and some people consider corn and potatoes vegetables, and they're the only vegetables they ever eat. And so... That's maybe sometimes where supplementation comes into play. If we can't encourage people to eat better foods, supplements don't replace the good foods, but they can pick up a little bit of slack. But we will be talking more about supplementation later. When I say whole grains, um, that is a grain, so it could be it could be wheat, it could be bulgur, it could be quinoa, it could be rice, it could be oatmeal, in its as most, most natural form as possible. So if you're choosing a piece of bread as an example, whole grain bread is better and you could probably actually see the grain in the bread as opposed to white bread or whole wheat bread where the good stuff has been swept out, ground up, some of it thrown away and then some of the nutrients are artificially put back in. And when I say legumes, those are things like kidney beans, navy beans, um, chickpeas, lentils, those are the type of beans that would be in a can of say beans and tomato sauce. And you'll, you'll see a lot of the same themes with the same foods throughout the presentation. Um, the Mediterranean diet recommends fish and seafood at least twice a week, poultry and eggs a few times a week, red meat no more than a few times per month, and pr preferably lean in small portions. Incorporate meatless meals into your week and sweets occasionally. And so this is, you're probably familiar with the Canada's Food Guide Pyramid or the Canada's Food Guide Recommendations. This is the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid and it essentially pictorial, pictorially shows what I just mentioned there. So the, the base is what you want to be doing every day and includes the physical activity that Laura is going to be addressing shortly. And then the, the bulk of the foods are going to be the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains and uh, the beans, nuts, legumes, seeds and herbs and spices as I mentioned. And then the tip of the iceberg there are the meats and the sweets. So mood in the Mediterranean diet, there's been so many studies and I just think this is absolutely fascinating. So, so this isn't somebody that's something that somebody just sort of thought up to try to encourage people to eat their vegetables and eat their greens. So the studies have shown that following a Mediterranean diet elevates mood, makes you feel better naturally and decreases the risk of depression. The nutrients in the Mediterranean diet, so when I say nutrients, that's vitamins, minerals, protein, as well as the, the good carbs and the good fats, um, as well as things like the essential fatty acids and things like omega-3 fats that we're going to be talking about. So the nutrients in the Mediterranean diet contrib contribute to healthy serotonin levels. 
Serotonin is a brain chemical or what we call a neurotransmitter and we have many, many in the brain. And um, they, they basically run our brain functions. And different brain chemicals can do different things to our thinking and our, our moods. Serotonin is known as sort of the, the feeling of well-being brain chemical. So we want to do the best that we can in our diets in order to have really healthy levels of serotonin in the brain for a sense of well-being. And it can also help to uh, minimize really big cravings and overeating, which can result in, you know, overweight and making you feel perhaps not, not as well as you could. Um, so the Mediterranean diet decreases as well the risk for heart disease and inflammation. So there's the inflammation piece again. Um, and inflammatory conditions that can increase risk for depression and other brain consequences down the road. When I talk about inflammation, and I'll, I'll just um, back up for a moment, because when I, when I talk to my patients and other people about foods and inflammation, I say it's not like you've got a swollen ankle or like an inflamed arm or something. Um, it, it's inflammation that goes on in the body, and it actually can be measured um, through, through uh, blood work. But um, so there are these inflammatory chemicals, essentially, that can float through our brains and throughout our body. And we know that they underlie um, not only mood and cognition, but underlie cro chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, um, depression for sure, Alzheimer's, all kinds of things. So whatever we can do naturally to decrease these inflammatory chemicals in our body, that's what we want to do in our brains and our bodies. And food is probably the best way to do that. So the MIND diet, this stands for the Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. So we're just going to call it the MIND diet for obvious reasons. And this is so cool. This just really gets me excited. Studies have been done on this and very re recently. The studies have shown um, it, it's been shown to reduce the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's by 53% in people who followed the diet rigorously and by 35%, which is still really significant, in people who kind of sort of followed the diet. So if you're more likely to kind of sort of follow a diet, a good diet, you're still going to get the benefits. So this is what the MIND diet incorporates, very similar to the Mediterranean diet and to foods that you're going to see in our grocery list for brain health. Includes at least six servings per week of leafy vegetables, so not as many as the Mediterranean diet would recommend. At least one serving per day of other vegetables, at least two, two servings of berries per week, berries very anti-inflammatory, antioxidative at least five servings of nuts per week, at least three servings of whole grains per day, at least four servings of legumes per week, at least one serving of fish per week, and at least two servings of poultry per week. So it's, it's, not, it's um, not like these diets are recommending going out and buying strange ingredients that we've never heard of before. It's stuff that's available to us and it's maybe just we, we haven't been aware of or as mindful about how we eat and, and how we can actually derive real benefits. So the dietary fats, I break them into the categories the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they really do quite, quite significantly fall into these categories. So, and I don't want you to worry about the terms monounsaturated and polyunsaturated and all of that. I'd just like you to be aware of the types of fats, where they come from, and what they do in your, your body and your brain. So good fats contribute to heart and brain health and uh, decrease depression risk. They're found in olive oil, canola oil, oil and walnuts, almonds, flax, and peanuts, including peanut butter. And then they're also found in fatty fish, ground flaxseed, once again the oil and walnuts, soybean, safflower, sunflower, canola, and corn oils. But there is a little bit of a caveat to the oils, the soybean, safflower, and sunflower, and corn oils that I'm going to talk about in a moment that does impact inflammation. So how many of you have heard of omega-3 fats? Yeah, and you've probably done a lot of reading about omega-3 fats, especially if you've had a brain injury or have had a family member or friend who's had one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they are, they are protective. We, we do need 
more research to actually provide very specific guidelines of if you're going to supplement with omega-3 supplements, how much is too much and, and all of that. And I will be addressing that. But um, the more I read about omega-3s, the, the more supportive I become of, of the use of them. And ideally, once again, trying to get our nutrients from whole foods is the best. Excellent food sources of omega-3s are salmon, especially wild and canned mackerel, sardines, and herring. So cold water fish are fattier fish because they have to stay warm <laughs> or something. But anyways, because omega-3s are found in the fat of fish, fattier fish have a higher amount of omega-3s. Good food sources, halibut, lobster, shrimp, white canned tuna, trout, and anchovies. And I'm, I'm glad to see that it's the canned tuna because it's far more affordable than going out and getting tuna steaks or whatever. And then the next best sources of omega-3s, um, soy and canola oil, flaxseed oil, walnuts and other nuts, chia and pumpkin seeds. So, and, and just as an aside, eating for brain and body health is also going to help regularity because a lot of these foods are natural, soluble fiber sources. And uh, so you get a little bit of bang for your buck in that department as well. So omega-3 supplements. You don't want to start supplements without talking to your doctor, and that's not just specific to omega-3s. It's specific to pretty much any supplement. Um, if some is good, more is not necessarily better, and if some is good, too much can actually be harmful, especially if you, especially if you have um, liver problems, kidney problems, um, any, any other type of... Uh, chronic condition other than the brain injury. Um, so you just want to make sure that, that you're making the right, the right choice and the right amount. Supplementation with omega-3s can result in bleeding if you're on blood thinners. And large amounts of omega-3s from supplements can result in bleeding in people not even on blood thinners. And that's really the big potential risk of supplementing incorrectly with omega-3s. So if I have patients, um, say, on warfarin, or another word for warfarin is Coumadin, there are some newer blood thinners out in the market now, newer generation that are being used. Um, even some people who are on low-dose aspirin, you want to make sure that you talk to your doctor because all of those things are blood thinners. You're on blood thinners for a reason. If your doctor has prescribed them, you're on them for a reason. Omega-3s work in many, many ways, um, and they're protective of cells in the brain and the body. Um, they help to uh, reduce our risk of stroke, um, but they also do contribute to some blood thinning. So you don't want to have crazy nosebleeds. You don't want to have internal bleeding. Um, you don't want to have any un unnatural bleeding, I, I guess we can call it that. So please talk to your doctor. So dietary fats, the bad fats, are ne have negative impact on brain and heart health. They increase inflammation and may increase risk for depression and the intensity of the depression. So the bad fats are the saturated fats, and some in moderation absolutely is fine. But you want to tip your ratio of the good fats to the bad fats for your brain and brain health and, and uh, overall health. So animal sources such as meat, poultry, lard, butter fat, dairy products that aren't low fat or fat free. If you have a steak or a pork chop, you want to make sure you cut off the visible fat. If you're having poultry, you want to remove the skin um, because that's where a lot of the, the really highly saturated fat and cholesterol is found. Plant sources known as tropical oil such as coconut oil, palm kernel oil, and palm oil are also very saturated. There's a, there's a big kind of movement out there um, that promotes coconut oil and, um, and it, it's, it's promoted to do all kinds of wonderful things. Um, I get a lot of questions about coconut oil and I've done a lot of literature searches to look for research on coconut oil that supports the benefits and I have yet to, found, to find studies that support the benefits of the coconut oil that, that people are talking about. If it's something you're doing or you're interested in doing, be just really try to educate yourself as much as possible about the pros and cons of adopting certain practices. The ugly fats are the trans fats. Trans fats are relatively new in human history. I mean, they've been around for a lot of years since we've been processing foods and wanting long shelf life. 
but relatively new in human history, especially if you compare it to, to natural foods. And these absolutely positively increase risk for cardiovascular disease, um, and trans fat consumption has been linked to depression and aggression. And when you look at the list of where they come from, a lot of people are really, really disappointed. Because <laughs> they're found in french fries and potato chips and pastries and packaged cookies. Things with long shelf lives are always going to have trans fats. A lot of fast foods do, uh, pre-packaged foods. Though as consumers are becoming more aware of trans fats and they're lobbying food manufacturers, food manufacturers are starting to be a little bit more cognizant of uh, trying to limiting the trans fats in the food, but um, they are out there and they will appear on food labels. So I'm a big uh, proponent of reading your food labels, you know, the one on the side that says how many calories per serving and how much fat and, and trans fat actually shows right up on there. If you can choose a product with zero trans fat, like if you're going and saying, I really want crackers, and Chris has told me to have whole grain crackers, but she's also told me to, if possible, eliminate the trans fat in my diet. So you pick two boxes of crackers off the shelf and you compare them and I would choose the one with the lower level of the trans fats or preferably zero trans fats. Omega-6 fats, this is important to note and when I mentioned that to a degree the canola oils, safflower, sunflower oils do have some protective properties. They are very abundant in our food supply because they're used in a lot of food, food products. So we, it can actually, if we choose to say cook or stir fry with the corn oil, corn oil sunflower, safflower, etc., that is going to give us more of the omega-6s that can be pro-inflammatory meaning omega-6 fats, these types of fats, can cause inflammation in the body. And because we get so much of these fats through foods, we don't want to be adding them to the diet. So if you talk to your doctor and you choose to supplement with omega-3 supplements, please don't go out and buy a bottle of omega-369 because I, I don't absolutely understand one single bit why they would put omega-6 in a supplement. When it causes inflammation, it can increase pain for people who have pain issues, and we get so much of it in, in our food supply. So, um, and, so and, and an imbalance between omega-6s and the omega-3s can result in inflammation and pain, as I mentioned, and risk for heart disease. So what you want to do for your cooking, my recommendation is olive oil, and people do talk about olive oil having a lower smoke point. So you, um, some people feel that you can't get your, your wok or whatever you're using, the, the, however you're stir frying or what have you, can't get it as hot. It's still very, very hard to get to the smoke point where the, the olive oil is going to kind of not be good anymore. Um, but oh, So olive oil is all I use at home. So that will increase your omega-3s. Um, olives, almonds, avocado, there are avocado oils out there. They're expensive, but they're out there. And these will achieve your anti-inflammatory benefits and may help with your pain management if pain is an issue, including headaches. So other possible benefits of substituting good fats for bad fats, less feelings of anger, and an increased resting en energy expenditure. What the heck does that mean? For those who um, are trying to manage their weight, potentially maybe trying to lose a little bit of weight, the good fats can actually help us burn more calories doing nothing. Woohoo! <laughs> so if you take for them for no other reason, that would be a good reason if weight management is one of your goals. So the Western diet. I'm just taking a peek at the time, okay, I think we're okay for now. So studies have shown that the Western diet, so like the North American diet that includes higher amounts of red and processed meats, high fat dairy, the trans fats, the ugly fats that we just talked about through processing, sweets and desserts and pop and fast foods, very, very high sugar diet, a diet that's very, very high in processed carbohydrates. Com compare, these can result in, and I know a lot of my slides kind of repeat, but I can't reinforce it enough, can cause depression, negative mental health states compared to the diets that are higher in the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, the fish, 
et cetera, like the MIND diet and the Mediterranean diet. So the carbohydrate connection. So carbohydrate is another word for sugar, but some carbohydrates are much better for us than others. So we have what we call our complex carbohydrates that have a lot more benefit to our minds and our bodies and they're more slowly absorbed into our bloodstream after we consume them um, so that we don't have the peaks and valleys in our blood sugars, the peaks and valleys in our serotonin levels, that brain chemical that gives us a feeling of well-being. So carbohydrates are needed for health and life. There's a lot of diets out there that try to completely eliminate carbohydrate and that is a dangerous thing to do. If you're choosing a diet like that to lose weight, oh, ho, ho, you're going to lose weight. But as soon as you start eating normally, your weight is going to skyrocket above what it was prior to you going on the low-carb or carb-free diet. Carbohydrates are also the primary and preferred fuel for our brains. So you do not want to starve your brain for carbohydrates. Um, but we want to choose the right ones, as I mentioned. A low-carbohydrate diet can worsen depression. And back, um, the Scarsdale diet way back in the day was a low-carb diet. Um, the, um, the Atkins diet, another very low-carb diet. And I had friends and family going on those, and they said it just turned them into bears. They were thrilled with the weight loss, but they, they didn't like how it impacted their, their personalities. And then, of course, when they went off, they gained all their weight back. So the good carbohydrates are vegetables, fruits, whole grains, there's that whole grain word again, the beans and legumes, so the kidney bees, peas and the chickpeas and the, the lentils, navy beans, um, it, white, the white beans that are actually the beans used in like beans and tomato sauce, and low-fat dairy in moderation. The bad carbohydrates are the processed sugars and starches. There is no food value in these foods. They might taste really good, they're going to give you calories. They may give you a little bit of energy temporarily, but there's really no food value. So um, you hear people saying, oh, I avoid anything white. So if you're avoiding white sugar and products that contain it and white flour and products that contain it, that is a good practice, absolutely a good practice. Processed refined bread, cereals and, um, and other grains that have been highly processed, Muffins, bagels, baked goods, crackers, desserts, candy, all of those types of things. Do you have to eliminate them? If you think of that Mediterranean diet pyramid, it, what, it still was there, but it was teeny, weeny, weeny little part of the pyramid. So everything in moderation, but I would say these things, less than moderation. You can incorporate it, but, but try to really, really cut back if you can. Carbohydrate consumption is closely linked to serotonin production, but we must choose our carbs wisely. And um, yes, yeah, so this is what I wanted to address. I wasn't sure if I had it on this next slide. So if you were to look at um, a, a graph and you were to eat, so here, here's a graph and we're going to talk about blood sugar and serotonin level. And you think, oh, I need some energy. I'm kind of running low. It's in the afternoon. I need a boost. So you grab a chocolate bar you're going to feel an immediate lift in energy and mood, but it's going to be very, very short-lived. So if we were able to track your blood sugar and your serotonin level on the same graph, you eat the chocolate bar, your blood sugar is going to peak up and drop, your serotonin is going to peak up and drop. So as I say, you're going to feel the immediate energy from the sugar, you're going to feel the immediate sense of well-being from the, the carbohydrate impact on your brain serotonin level but it's going to drop very, very quickly. So that's why sometimes people feel that they have carbohydrate cravings because they can't moderate their levels. Their blood sugars are jumping all over the map, their brain chemicals are jumping all over the map, and so they're looking for the quick energy and the quick feeling of well-being, but it's not being maintained. The good carbohydrates on the previous screen um, those are going to moderate your blood sugar levels. They're going to moderate your serotonin levels. You're not going to have the peaks and valleys. You're going to have a more level energy and a more level mood. Very, very important. Oh, and uh, I, just going back there, um, serotonin as well can give a sense of satiety. 
so you're not going to have cravings. If you're having cravings now, and that's something that's bothering you and you want to get a handle on, um, if we can moderate our serotonin levels by choosing good foods and the good carbs, then um, you're, you're going to have a better control over your hunger as well. Other food mood considerations, a healthy breakfast and healthy um, snacks stabilize blood sugars and prevent the anxiety of producing sugar lows. Eat five to six times a day, and this is a really, really big piece, and, and all the literature that I read and continue to read and the new stuff coming in says it's so important not to just have like your three big meals a day or don't skip breakfast and have a big lunch and supper. You want to have smaller meals incorporating small snacks throughout the day for that evenness, and um, you don't want to go more than three to four hours between feeding your brain and feeding your body with the good stuff. Protein boosts alertness. So um, when I speak at conferences and then they have a lunch break and the lunch buffet is pasta and bread and giant chocolate chip cookies and I have to speak in the afternoon, I go, oh great, everybody's going to be asleep. I'm going to try not to take it personally because it's all that carbohydrate that was in the lunch. If we were to provide high protein lunches at conferences, people would be far more alert to sit and listen to what the speakers have to say. Don't overdo alcohol. And um, for those of you who have already received education um, as a result of your injury or family's injury, we actually recommend abstinence from alcohol um, because it can impact depression, but it can also increase risk for seizures following brain injury. So we say wait at least two years but ideally, um, if people can just abstain from alcohol, because it's not good for anybody, let alone somebody who's had a brain injury. And, you know, risk for falls if you've had a brain injury or you haven't had a brain injury. You don't want to be drinking and having a fall and, and then having a bigger problem on your hands. And too much caffeine can result in anxiety in some people. Supplements. Um, you can't eat a terrible diet and take supplements and think that your brain is okay. Supplements can pick up the slack. There are some supplements that I recommend, and it's coming up in the next slide or two, that I think is a good idea for everybody to take or for everybody to consider because it's hard to get some of these nutrients in our food supply. But you cannot eat a crappy diet and think your brain's going to be okay and take some of these supplements that I'm suggesting. It just unfortunately doesn't work that way. And, you know, over, you know, over the years of, um, you know, medical science and, and uh, studies and, and research, um, a lot of people have tried to take the good, figure out what the good things are in a whole food and take those good things out and package them and put them into a pill. And sometimes that can be helpful, but there's so much about food and what's in food that we still don't know, if you can believe it. 2017, we still don't know all the goodness that's in the food and all the components. So we can take out a few of the things that we know are good and plunk them into a bottle. But as soon as you remove some of those natural good things from other things in the food, they work synergistically or they work together for the benefits. So that's why supplements aren't the be-all and the end-all. And in some cases, researchers have shown that supplementing these things that we thought were fabulous can actually be harmful. And I'll give you an example just to demonstrate. So beta carotene is, a, is um, something that gives, gives um, carrots the orange color, but it's also a nutrient. It can do some really good things. So um, a number of years ago, people, there was some research done that said, oh, beta carotene um, prevents cancer. So people started taking beta carotene and then we found over time that people who were smokers actually had a higher risk for lung cancer if they supplemented with beta carotene. So that doesn't have anything to do with brain injury, but it's an example of why thinking you can take a supplement and A, not have harm, but B, be getting everything you need is, isn't necessarily beneficial. So more research is needed before we can recommend specific supplements. The key lies in the whole food. The brain-body benefits result from the way all components of a food work together, as I was just mentioning. Supplementation, if some is good, more is not necessarily better and may cause harm. Try to, in I, whole foods, whole foods, whole foods, I think I have the, those two words on almost every slide. And you do want to get guidance. 
But this is what I suggest, and this I in this presentation last year, I did not include this slide because I didn't think that there was enough evidence to support it. Um, but from more recent research and speaking to Dr. Keith Sequera, who many of you are probably aware of and known and have spoken and maybe have had appointments with, um, in consultation with him and things that we know, these are some things that, that we we suggest. I'm not going to say recommend because everybody, you know, can make their own decisions. But a daily complete multivitamin mineral. A megadose product from a health food store is not recommended. So it can be your garden variety multivitamin mineral that you get at your pharmacy. And if you're not sure, there's all kinds of products out there. Talk to your pharmacist. Say just, what's a, a good complete multivitamin mineral that I can take? Vitamin D, vitamin D3, and that's the only form in Canada that vitamin D is. So basically just vitamin D. 2,000 units per day um, is what people I generally recommend for people, but it may be more and it may be less. And absolutely positively, next time you see your doctor, if you haven't already had this test done in the past year, ask your doctor to assess your blood level of vitamin D, and it's a big long word, 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Very, very important. The minimum blood level should be 75. Sure. Can, can we do three more minutes? Three more minutes. Because <laughs> I, I, I think we're, and it, it, yeah. So anyway, um, get your blood level checked. You want at least 75, but supplementing 1,000 to 2,000 will not be harmful and possibly quite helpful. We've talked a lot about omega-3s. Vitamin B complex plus vitamin C is something that um, you may want to consider, especially for people who deal with headaches and pain. And you may consider magnesium supplement, but just be aware that it may cause some loose stools. Um, so we're going to take a break. Um, now we'll, we'll be moving on to the physical activity because I can just let people know what's following and they can... Okay, take a break. <laughs> Ten minutes? Okay, thanks everybody.
turn my back on. Oh, okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I just have one more slide to discuss, and then you, the slides beyond that are your, your grocery list for health, and I don't have to go through the grocery list in detail because you've got them either in your handouts here or for those at other sites, you'll, you'll have it in your, um, in your slides. But this is a really fascinating area of new research. Well, I say new. Research has been going on for years. But what we're learning more and more all the time is absolutely fascinating. And um, some of our staff here, we were chatting on the break. So we call it the gut microbiome. So basically, your gut, your innards, your digestive system can really, really impact your mental and physical health, um, depending on what you're eating, as we've been talking about tonight. And then also through the use of certain things called probiotics, which are good biotic, good, um, good bacteria in our guts. And um, so if, if we can improve our gut microbiome or the good bugs in our digestive system, um, that's really important for decreasing inflammation, reducing risk of infection, and improving, phys improving physical and mental health. So probiotic, as I mentioned, is the good bacteria in our gut. Prebiotics are the food for the good bacteria. So probiotics you can take in supplement form. Um, you, when you're going out to buy a yogurt, um, you know pretty much every yogurt now on the shelf says has active bacterial culture. Not every yogurt has the right bacterial culture that's alive in the right amount. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail tonight about that. Um, but just be aware that probiotics can be in the foods we're eating and they can be through supplements as well. And there's a myriad of products out there. And you can uh, talk to your pharmacist. Pharmacists and physicians would probably be good people to talk to for some suggestions. So prebiotics, because prebiotics are food for the good bacteria, you want to incorporate these foods into your diet. And examples of those are artichokes, not that I know a lot of people who really eat a lot of artichokes, but if you like them, that's a good thing because they're a prebiotic. Asparagus, there's the whole grains again. Bananas, garlic, onions, chicory root, and yogurt. And fermented foods as well, very, very gut healthy, very digesti digestive healthy. Um, and those include sauerkraut, kefir, kimchi, kombucha and miso and you may or may not have heard of of all of those things um kombucha is getting um a lot of press now and it's actually a fermented beverage and all different flavors so that might be something that you want to to look into there's some stores around london here in town that do provide them and, and there's a company that actually produces it right here in london on dundas street and miso so if you go out for japanese food have a cup of miso soup so that's just a very small snapshot on the gut microbiome. Stay tuned for more exciting information. And then I'm going to um, pass the microphone over now to Laura. But please, please go through your grocery list for health. And when you're going to the grocery store, pre-plan. And please try to choose as many of the foods as you can on the list. You don't have to eat all of the foods on these lists in order to get the benefits. Choose your favorite ones, but please pick and choose some of these very anti-inflammatory, antioxidative foods and incorporate them into your, your uh, day every single day. Thanks, everybody. And Laura will be right up. Okay. Thanks, Chris. There's your grocery list. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Just trying to go through slowly so people can get an idea. Oh, do I have to go to the next one? Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Nope. Okay. Hello. So those of you here at Parkwood can see me, but those of you who are at the other sites wanted to let you know who's chatting with you tonight. And uh, Kelly already introduced me, but my name's Laura. I'm a physio here at Parkwood, and I also teach up at the university. And you got to see a little bit already about how uh, food can interact with exercise and sleep um, or fatigue. And 
part of when I was thinking about how to put this uh, presentation together, is thinking that it might seem like a weird combination about uh, putting together physical activity and sleep. Uh, so I wanted to show you how those things actually do fit together. Uh, regular exercise has been found to improve sleep disturbance and fatigue. If you're wondering what, the sleep, distur what sleep disturbance means, that could be if you're having trouble getting to sleep at night or staying asleep. And <clears throat> the research that backs that up is actually rationale for why they promote regular exercise in some of our clinical practice guidelines. So the uh, documents that help drive um, what we choose to do as clinicians to help our clients out. So that's true for both people with marked severe brain injury and those with mild brain injury. Improved sleep can reduce daytime fatigue, which is really important because that might enable you to actually engage in physical activity or feel up to doing some sort of physical activity during the day. And participating in physical activity can, could mean that you're getting back to doing the things you enjoy doing, something that's meaningful to you. So hopefully you come away from this presentation with an understanding of why sleep and exercise or physical activity are important and what you as survivors can do, what your family members can do to help out. And at the end, we'll have questions or time for questions for both Chris and myself. Okay, so unless you were writing an exam in kinesiology or physical therapy, you can use the terms physical activity and exercise as interchangeable terms. Um, so I want you guys to know that you can use those um, to mean the same thing. And I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what physical activity or exercise could mean. Because what I picture in my head could be different from what you guys picture in your head. So it could be things like cardiovascular or aerobic training. So those could be things like cycling, swimming, or walking. They're activities that are repetitive um, and they might get your heart going, um, you might find that you're breathing more heavily, uh, but they're repetitive types of activities. And there could be things like strengthening or resistance training. So those might be with the goal of trying to help you lift more or um, to, to um, hold something for a longer period of time or if you want to make your muscles bigger. So those could be things like lifting a barbell or a dumbbell could involve doing what we call body weight exercises where you're trying to push your own body weight around. So I have a picture there of somebody doing a push-up, but that could be also be things like doing a lunge or a squat or a sit-up if for some odd reason you enjoy doing those. And um, another type of strengthening activity could involve using an elastic band. So if you've ever been to a physical therapist, you might have seen a lot of these elastic bands that we like to use, and those can help um, with strength training as well. Then there's also balance training. And I'm going to give you guys some examples of balance training tonight, but those could be things like yoga, tai chi, pilates, or it could be something as simple as getting you to stand on one foot or stand with your feet together. And the reason why I wanted to bring up yoga, tai chi, and pilates is because those are types of activities that you get more out of than just working on your balance. They might challenge your strength, your flexibility, and all those types of exercises get you to think about your breathing. Um, so there's a meditation component to it. And if you guys have um, worked with a, a social worker or learned about meditation or deep breathing exercises and how that can help with mood, then maybe you can see how yoga, Pilates, and Tai Chi can give you a little bit more bang for your buck. There is lots of research out there um, that explains the benefits uh, to engaging in exercise. So this is just a quick short, uh, summary. And one of them being that engaging exercise can help with our endorphin release. So if you've ever heard of the term a runner's high, sometimes you'll hear people engage in exercise because they say it makes them feel good. And that's actually true. So physiologically, because exercise is a physical stress on your body, it makes your brain secrete more of these feel-good hormones. Um, so that's how it helps us to understand why it improves our mood and help us to get to sleep at night. Okay? And engaging in more activity can help to improve your stamina and activity tolerance 
And in that same vein, help reduce those feelings of depression, anxiety, or stress that you may be dealing with. And it helps uh, with reducing other things that aren't necessarily related to our brain injury, but things like decreasing our blood pressure and our risk for chronic disease. So then for those of you who are family members, um, there's benefits to exercise not just related to brain injury. So as survivors, there's many things that you can do. But first and foremost, you want to pick an activity that you enjoy doing. If you see people running down the road and think that that's silly, then you're probably not going to choose that activity. Okay? So think of something you actually enjoy doing because then you're more likely to do it. Find a partner. So there's lots of research out there that shows having social support, meaning somebody to do exercise with you, means you're more likely to actually engage in that task. So survivors and family, we're talking about pairing up. Start gently. Now this means something different to each and every person. And this idea of trying to figure out what does starting gently mean can be very frustrating. And so we'll talk a little bit about how you can actually figure out how to start gently. You're going to schedule exercise into your day. So you may have already learned about the importance of using an agenda or using your phone perhaps to write appointments and things that you want to do throughout the day into your schedule. And that's really helpful because it helps you to keep track of your symptoms, but also helps remind you to plan for a rest afterwards so that you're using those ideas of planning and pacing your activity accordingly. Progress slowly but consistently. So if you have what you've done written down and help you figure out um, how to progress the next time or whether or not you're ready. But this is another point of trying to figure out what slowly means that can be very, very frustrating. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to make that less frustrating. And pay attention to how you feel. Okay, so this relates back to a few points. We talked about uh, finding a partner to do exercise with. So if you have difficulty identifying when your symptoms are getting worse, so when your headache's getting worse, when you're getting tired, that type of thing, sometimes exercising with a, with a partner can help you pay more attention or be more self-aware. So I always tell the story of this husband and wife pair that they'd always go for walks together in the evening. It was a nice time for them to have quiet time together. So you didn't like um, having to talk while he was walking. And she would watch him because when he would get tired, his face would turn bright red. But he was really bad at telling when uh, he was getting tired. So if she'd see that, then she could be his barometer to remind him, okay, time to turn around or it's time to take a break. The other thing that you can do if um, you have difficulty trying to uh, figure out when it's time to take a break is if you use that schedule, so we said to schedule it into your day, and you engage in the exercise, you can uh, record your symptoms before and after to give you an idea, did my symptoms increase or did they stay the same with that activity? It's okay if your symptoms increase a little bit while you're engaging activity. So if your headache is a five out of 10 at baseline for you and you go for a 10 minute walk and it gets up to a seven out of 10, that's okay, provided that you get back down to that 5 out of 10 within the next hour after you've finished that activity. If it stays up for the rest of the day, that's probably a good sign that next time you go for a walk, you need to back off. So you need to do less time or maybe go at a less busy time of day. That make sense? I can only actually get feedback from people in front of me, so <laughs> I will take that as a yes. <laughs> And the other important thing to keep in mind is to do, ma do something no matter how you feel. So you may have heard the phrase, use or lose it. That is actually neurophysiologically sound. If you stay at rest, it's tough for you to get going. Um, if you do something every day, then that helps you to maintain those physiological changes that you've um, created by engaging in exercise. Okay, so I said starting gently can be really frustrating because trying to figure out what that means for each person can be very different. 
So one thing you can do is use a timer. So if previously you used to go walking for an hour every afternoon, or so, just for an example, um, trying to go back and do an hour of walking every day might be too much. So you might want to start with 10 minutes just to see how you make out. So you can set your timer for five minutes. Once that five minute timer goes off, turn around and walk home. Then check out your symptoms. Doing okay? And maybe later that day you could do another 10 minute walk. Or perhaps you've decided, I'm gonna wait till tomorrow to try and do another walk because I have all these other things I have to do, right? Because just doing exercise is probably not the only thing you have to do that day. Some of you are spouses or parents, uh, or you have other, other responsibilities that you have to complete during that day. You can use the point system, which you may have um, heard in an earlier presentation, but that's that idea of give, giving every activity a point value so that um, you have kind of an activity diet and you have a certain number of points that you can accumulate each day. Following your rules for planning and pacing. Um, so if you haven't been to a previous presentation, that's this idea of using your schedule. If you have an activity that you're going to do, make sure you plan for a rest afterwards. So with each activity, you have a rest in between. This next point is don't start from where you left off. So uh, where you left off pre-injury. So I've worked with some clients who used to do triathlons and marathons. And so for them, starting gently meant doing five kilometer run. And I had to tell them, no, we're going to start with walking. And we're going to try, see, can you do 10 minutes? Can we work our way up to 30 minutes um, over a week or a few weeks? Everybody's a little bit different. So that's where it gets frustrating for people because sometimes they may feel I, they want to do more. So they push themselves. And they might push themselves too far, their symptoms get flared, and then they have to take a few days off or before they have time to kind of recalibrate and get back to progressing more slowly. So that's why using that schedule, writing down your symptoms can be very helpful in helping you gauge that. But you can expect a few bumps along the, along the road. It doesn't mean that it's going to um, uh, completely derail your recovery. <clears throat> then the other idea is to monitor your intensity. So we talked about writing things down in your schedule book and I'll give you a couple other ideas. If you haven't seen this graph before, this is our planning and pacing graph and it's this idea of trying to stay within the safe zone. So our safe zone is where our symptoms are at their lowest. Some of us don't have symptom, don't have symptom free days. Um, so we're always, we always have uh, some amount of symptoms each day and that danger zone is when our symptoms are getting to a 10 out of 10. So we want to try and stay out of there, uh, but as you see with our squiggly line, it's okay if our symptoms start to increase a little bit with activity as long as we remember to stop and take a break so we can get back down to baseline before we go again. So measuring intensity. There's tons of different ways that you can do that. You can do something called rating of perceived exertion. And that just means answering the question of how hard do you feel you are working? And this is based on a researcher uh, named Dr. Borg. And their scale was, I think it's like 6 to 20, and it's based on heart rate. But what makes a lot more sense to me is trying to choose a number from 0 to 10. And what we sometimes suggest for our clients to do is try and uh, find an intensity that for you feels like you're working at a 5 out of 10 or half, half, half of what's your hardest work. You can also use a timer, right? So we said that that's one way we can measure intensity and keep track to figure out how to start gently. You would also monitor your heart rate and figure out um, what is 50 to 60 percent of your maximum heart rate. So to figure out what your maximum heart rate is, you're going to take 220 minus your age. So I am 30, and so I would go from 220 minus 30, which puts me at 190, and then I'd multiply that by 0.5 or by 0.6 to get my 50 to 60% range. So you can do that on your calculators at home to figure that out for you. Or you can use um, an app called Heart Rate. 
It's free on, uh, on any smartphone, whether you're an Android or an iPhone user, and that figures out your training rate for you. Uh, you can also use a heart rate monitor to measure your own heart rate. Um, there's wrist or chest um, straps that are available. A lot of people are now into the Fitbits, if you've seen those. And if you've ever seen a treadmill, an elliptical, or a stationary bike, you might maybe notice uh, little metal plates on them, on the handles, and those use this uh, type of technology where they can monitor your heart rate through your hands. Or you can monitor your heart rate the old-fashioned way, manually. <coughs> I was trying to figure out how to, how to be able to, to show our clients who are not here at Parkwood how to measure your heart rate uh, manually. So if you hold your right hand out in front of you as though you're holding a plate, um, with your palm facing the sky, and then you take two fingers in your other hand like you're doing the Scouts Promise or the Girl Guide Promise, then you reach over to your wrist so that you're on the same side of your wrist as your thumb, but it, your fingernail should be facing you on your left hand. Hopefully you should hear a pulse or feel a pulse. If you can't feel it, Close your eyes. I know I misspoke when I said see your pulse, but sometimes I find it easier to feel my pulse with my eyes closed. So that's another trick that you can use. Another way that you can do that is at your neck. So you'd find the corner of your jaw that's closest to your ear, and then reach down on your neck. You'll probably be right on a muscle. So then you just feel a little bit closer um, towards your throat to try and find your pulse there. <clears throat> then to figure out your heart rate, you want to count the number of beats uh, that occur over a whole minute. So over 60 seconds, and that gives you your heart rate in beats per minute. Okay, so balance training. And the reason why I want to talk about balance training is because it's so, so, so common after brain injury, and there are easy things that you can do at home to try and work on your balance. You can uh, stand on one foot and try to count to 15 or 30. And the way that I usually suggest people do this is if you're tea drinkers like me and you have to boil the kettle, stay in the kitchen when you're boiling the kettle. Um, have your hands over top of the counter so that you can grab on if you need to. And try to stare straight ahead at your cupboard and see if you can stand on one foot while you count and see how far up you can get. If you can get to 30 seconds, you're going to try the other foot. You could do heel-toe walking or grapevine walking. And uh, so heel-toe walking, you're doing going forward, heel-to-toe. Um, and grapevine walking is when you walk sideways. Um, and usually it suggests people try and do this on their way back from the washroom. If you have a hallway uh, where your washroom is, then you're close to the wall so that you can grab on if you need to. Ways that you can make balance training more difficult are to close your eyes or to turn your head from side to side or up and down. And that's because the way that your brain helps to enable you to stay upright is they need information from your eyes and information about where your head is in space. You have this thing called your vestibular system that tells your brain which way it's, your head is turned. And so it takes information from both those systems as well as something called your proprioceptive system, which are sensory receptors in your skin in, and joints in your limbs that tell your brain about where your, where your limbs are in space. So all those systems kind of have to chit-chat together. And so if you take away one of those sources of information, that can help to try and make your balance task more challenging. There's also ways in which you can make this easier. So you can do core or leg strengthening, so things like squats. So you think about what you have to do in order to get down onto the toilet or onto the couch and get back up. You do lunges. Um, so again, you could be at the counter and reach back with one foot to go down onto one knee and come back up. Or supermans, which I realize I don't know how to describe that where you can't see it. But there's lots of different um, exercises that you can either look up online or um, if you go to a gym, you can ask, are there different ways that I can strengthen my core um, or legs um, to help me at home? 
Squats and lunges are great because they don't cost you anything to do. They just cost you time. You can do compression with resistance bands. So I talked about those elastic bands that us physios seem to like so much. And I have a picture there of our physiotherapy assistant with the band wrapped around his arms. I mentioned this thing called your proprioceptive system. And that band helps to um, stimulate those sensory receptors in your skin to give you your brain more information about where you are in space. We also use something called a weighted compression vest. So that's another way to stimulate your proprioceptive system. And there's a picture of me there with a vest on. And it's just a neoprene vest that we can tighten and put weights in it to give your brain more uh, sense of where you are in space. They can be very warm to wear during the summer. So some of our clients like to use compressive undergarments like Spanx or Under Armour. So to recap, our survivors are going to make a plan. You're going to choose something that you like to do. Try and figure out what your starting level of intensity is. Choose a time of day. Track your progress. And think about where you want to be in a week and where you want to be in six months. The reason why this is helpful is if you share this information with your clinician you're working with, it can help them figure out how to get you to that goal or redefine it to make sure that you're actually going to achieve what you want. Family, you can be an exercise partner or a cheerleader. You can help your family member uh, monitor their intensity and help them to make a plan or schedule. Sleep. Okay, so sleep disturbance, very, very common following brain injury. Could be classified as insomnia, which means you're not getting enough sleep. Or it could be hypersomnia, where you feel like you're sleeping all the time. Poor sleep, we know, is associated with daytime fatigue and poor prognosis. So we mentioned before, if you have poor sleep, you might not feel like doing anything during the day. So that can inhibit our willingness or want to engage in physical activity or some of the other things that we want to do. And poor sleep can worsen our symptoms of poor attention, memory, and learning capabilities. So if anybody's parent out there, you've tried to go to work after a sleepless night, you might know what I'm talking about. Or if you've had a child not sleep or refuse to sleep at night and see how cranky they are the next day, that might make sense to you. So as survivors, what you can do is talk to your family physician to figure out what's right for you. There's lots of medications out there that you can try. Um, and what's right for you is dependent on your past medical history. So some of the medications that they use to help with sleep are mood uh, medications, so things to help with anxiety and depression. So don't be surprised if some of those things are recommended to you because um, I like using the example of Viagra because it was not actually created to help in the bedroom. It was actually meant to help people with cardiovascular problems, so just an added benefit that they found out that that's what it helps for. And um, medications that help to reduce feelings of anxiety and depression have also been found to um, help with headaches and help with sleep. So if somebody suggests an antidepressant to you, it doesn't mean that they're telling you you have depression, but that that's the reason why they're, they're using it to help you sleep. Melatonin is something your body creates naturally, but it might not create enough of it after your brain injury, and it's something that you need in order to feel sleepy. So sometimes that's a supplement that can be recommended to you. Cognitive behavioral therapy um, is another thing that you can engage in with um, either a social worker or a psychologist. And exercise, as we said before, there's light therapy, there's more uh, research coming out on that, and planning and pacing activity. The one thing that I want to stress, because a lot of our uh, clients tell me that they don't want to use meds or they're fearful of using meds, please note that the aim is to improve your sleep-wake cycle so that you're sleeping when you want to sleep and you're awake when you want to be awake. Um, the purpose is not to make you dependent on these meds that you have to take them for the rest of your life. They're meant to be um, intermittent. <coughs> the other thing that we want to look at is scheduling to regulate your sleep-wake cycles because having a regular bedtime and wake time can be very helpful in regulating um, your body's own production of melatonin, for example, and your body's own production of cortisol, which is important for helping you feel awake. So some other things that you can do might be classified under stimulus control. So it could be things like removing electronics, 
from the bedroom, doing something to relax before bed, so probably not talking to your insurance companies right before bedtime. Um, remember that the bedroom is for sleep and intimacy only, and go to bed when you're tired or sleepy. So you'll see in some places they'll say, no napping. And then other places they'll say, you should nap. And um, what is consistent in the literature is to go to sleep when you're tired or sleepy. So if you're tired or sleepy during the day, have a nap. But try not to have that nap for three or four hours and have it disrupt your nighttime sleep. So try and restrict that as much as you can. And if you have trouble getting to sleep at night because you're not feeling sleepy, then try and go find an activity to do in dim light that's relaxing to you and try again. You'll also see things classified under this uh, heading of sleep hygiene. So those could be things like avoiding caffeine or other stimulants, maybe exercising daily but not right before bedtime, avoiding alcohol and nicotine right before bed, avoid large heavy meals and excessive fluid intake, uh, promote sleep friendly environment, so that was that stimulus control that we talked about before, and getting up at the same time every day and exposing yourself to natural light every morning. And that's because that helps um, with producing more cortisol to help you feel a little bit more awake. So family, the same tips are good for you too. Uh, so you need to try and support your survivor in participating in some of these sleep hygiene and stimulus control ideas, whether that's aligning your sleep-wake cycle with your partner or promoting a sleep-friendly environment and avoiding caffeine and heavy meals before bed, just as a couple examples. So, in summary, sleep and exercise, very important uh, with respect to recovering from brain injury. And there are some simple tips that you can use. They might be tough to implement, uh, but just know that that's okay to use some trial and error to figure, figure out what works best for you. And thank you very much for listening. Okay. And if you want to find out more, there's some links for you as well. Okay. We're here. Okay. Are there any questions from our park website? Yes, at the back. So, for the, I don't know how well the sound travels, so I'm just going to repeat the question. So the question was um, related to the fact that I brought up yoga and meditation and wondering does guided imagery also help or interact with people post brain injury? Oh, if it's on a CD? <coughs> Yep, so she's asking about different sounds that you might have on a CD and things like that. And what I understand um, from the social worker on our team and some of my clients that I've uh, talked to, there's lots of different apps um, that you can get that have different sounds um, that can help people with finding... Um, finding opportunities to help them relax at night. Not every sound works for every person, so that you have to find something that you find is relaxing, uh, but certainly a lot of our clients have tried um, different meditation apps or different sound apps or CDs uh, that they found have worked for them. Mm -hmm. No, but I, I guess you could pick a sound that irritated you and then the consequences okay. you are now irritated okay. but yeah okay any other questions from those of you at Parkwood yes so the question was about the points program and how you're assigning points so this is something that was actually created by our uh, occupational therapist. And um, if you think about the idea of the Weight Watchers program, every food has a point value associated with it. And for your, um, for your diet, you're only allowed to 
accumulate a certain number of points per day in order to help you reach your weight goal. So the points program for planning and pacing, each activity has a certain number of points associated with it related to how tough that or symptom provoking that activity is for you. And then you have a certain number of points that you're allowed to accrue within that day in order to help you stay within your safe zone. So try not to exacerbate your symptoms. Trying to figure out what points or how many points you attribute to an activity is something you most likely need guidance from an occupational therapist for. Um, there, our occupational therapist is actually coming out with an app um, to help people do the points program. I'm not sure how close that is to being released. My boss is shaking his head. It's not quite ready. So um, that will be coming. But that may be, if you guys aren't working with an occupational therapist um, or you haven't heard of the points program, that's maybe just not a solution that um, that's going to work for you at this time. But I just wanted to mention it in, so that you could see a link to something that you may already be doing. Any other questions from Parkwood? Okay. We did so have a uh, yep. another question from Oh, thank you. Um, we did have a question from one of the other sites um, asking that if you were to buy a bag of chips that says zero trans fats on it, does it truly have no trans fats? That is a fabulous question. Um, because no, even if you're choosing a product that says zero trans fats, the government labeling laws has allowed, and I don't remember the exact number of grams of trans fats um, that are considered to be zero. Um, off the top of my head, it might be five grams, but um, if you're doing your absolute best to avoid trans fats and reading the labels, you still may be getting some but because right now the labeling law is allowing some to still be considered zero. I'm not, I, I, hopefully, did I explain that correctly? Um, so if it says zero, it's still going to be very little compared to if it says 10, um, but it doesn't mean it's trans fat free. Oh, sure. Yes, please. So the next question is on nutrition. What do you think of the recommendations to go gluten-free? Wow. Do you have three hours? <laughs> um, so that, that's, at this point in time, there is not a lot of research to support, um, like at real research trials to support eliminating gluten from the diet, though I'm sure that there are some people in the room right now and, and people tuning in from other sites that are, are saying that's absolutely not the case. For people who truly absolutely need to avoid gluten, they have um, a disorder called celiac disease and it's a gastrointestinal or a digestive system issue where they can't handle things that contain gluten. Gluten is a, um, a component of a lot of grain products. Um, so it's, it's abundant in our, in our food supply as well. Um, but there are some books out there. There are you know, lots of books and things in the media. And if you're to Google gluten, there are people saying that it's very inflammatory, um, that it can cause all kinds of problems, including skin disorders, et cetera. So I would say that if going gluten-free is something that you choose to do, um, as long as you're not avoiding whole food groups where you're not going to be getting certain nutrients from that group. So if you're avoiding certain foods, be aware of the nutrients that are found in those foods and find ways of getting those nutrients from another food. And then just listen to your body. I always say to people, listen to your body. As long as you're doing something that is not unsafe, no, hang on. As long as you're doing something that's not dangerous and you feel that you're getting benefits from, go for it. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more research over time um, really looking at gluten and, and finding out exactly what it may or may not do. Having said that, everybody is different. 
So, um, so you can choose to pursue it. Um, just be aware that a lot of foods that um, are out there contain gluten that you would never think, like salad dressing, soy sauce, things like that. So you're going to have to really educate yourself in, in order to become truly gluten-free if that's something you want to try. Thanks, Chris. I think the next question is for you as well. Is kefir a source of calcium? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oh, I should know the answer to that, and I don't. Um, I could Google it really quick, but maybe not as quick as the person who just answered it. Um, I apologize, I don't know the answer to that. But it is a very beneficial thing to incorporate um, in, into your, your meal plan in the course of a week because of the fermentation and the benefits it can have on the gut microbiome. And I apologize, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to look it up. And the question before that was, is fibromyalgia considered a chronic disease? And I can take that one. Uh, so for those of you guys who don't know what fibromyalgia is, um, that is something that causes people to live with chronic pain. They might also have a lot of fatigue throughout the day. Um, if you're living with fibromyalgia on top of your brain injury, um, you may be able to use some of the strategies you've learned to help you cope with fibromyalgia that will be helpful in coping with brain injury. So a lot of my clients, if they're also living with fibromyalgia, they've learned about playing and pacing strategies um, to try and do small bursts of activity interspersed with rest to help them reduce their pain. That can also, uh, that's a strategy that's helpful um, to adapt with, um, with how you engage in activity post brain injury to try and um, reduce how much you're exacerbating your headaches, dizziness, or other symptoms that you may experience since your brain injury. Thanks, Lauren. Um, if I could interject um, in the, the fibromyalgia question as well, um, well, changing your diet will not likely eliminate the pain. It can still help with it as we talked in the nutrition section. Another thing too that's interesting to note is that um, vitamin D deficiency can result in pain symptoms that mirror fibromyalgia pain. So I really encourage people to get their vitamin D levels assessed because part of your fibromyalgia-like pain may be partly a vitamin D deficiency. And the next question I see is, are there any exercises online that you can recommend? So what we showed tonight, and I don't know, can they still see my slideshow? Kelly, can they can they still see my slide or or no? Can they still see my slideshow? Yeah, I think okay. so. Um, so, <clears throat> so I showed you guys some balance exercises that you guys can do. There's also our website here at the end of uh, my slideshow that says www.sjhc dot london dot on dot ca forward slash concussion dash mtbi and if you go in there and look at um, our 101 series our abi 101 series um, there's a video of me where I talk a little bit about some vision exercises in addition to some balance exercises uh, the other thing that's a, a great option to make sure you're choosing exercises that are appropriate level of difficulty for you and also to make sure that you're not going to cause yourself harm by engaging in something that's tough for you. Um, if you have a YMCA in your area or another gym, um, lots of gyms will have you work with a personal trainer as your first session uh, to before they let you loose in their gym and so they focus on safety and they can work on creating a program that's right for you and I really like the YMCA because they will um, tailor the cost of your membership to what you're able to pay so something to keep in mind. I just looked up the uh, key for calcium question and it is an, a really good source of calcium actually in a 175 gram serving which is about the size of the individual yogurts that you can get at the grocery store um, has about 210 milligrams of calcium and that's comparable to well so a cup of milk is around 300 
So 210 is a, a good source of calcium. So thank you for the question. All right, so I think those are all our questions for this evening, and we're going to wrap up. I'd like to thank everybody for attending, and thank Laura and Chris for taking time to come and speak to us tonight. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And just a reminder um, to people who are watching online, there is an online evaluation. It's really quick to complete, if you could do that for us. And here at Parkwood, there are also some evaluations that uh, we'd like you to complete, if you could take a few minutes to do that. Thanks, everyone. And next week is our last week, and we're going to have two survivors that are going to come and speak and tell us their stories. <laughs>